Today, you better be tasting because he is good. Turn with me to Philippians. Thank you, praise team and choir, for continuing to lead us in worship well and effectively and passionately, thanking God for them regularly. If you turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, we're going to continue. And we're looking at verses 12 through 16 this morning. And we're talking about uh, there is joy in this upward journey. Joy in the upward journey. As we know, the whole theme of Philippians is this joy and contentment continually. That it is ours because of Christ. And that this morning, this is... This, this, this is a verse that really seems to, if, if we can settle our hearts on this, and if we can take away what, what Paul was telling the Philippians and what God is telling us, and as he was telling them as well, it will settle us for the rest of the journey. It will help us as we move forward and as we move upward in Christ looking forward to that time when we are face-to-face -face with him. Focus is, as we read this indeed, that Paul is helping them to understand what the focus, what the push, what the purpose of the Christian life is, or, or, or what is the mindset of the believer as they are journeying joyfully in Christ. And we'll see that this morning. Stand with me, please, as we read those verses. We can read together is actually found in your bulletin in the center. And let's all read together at that. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Amen. May God add a blessing as we only read, but we do his word. Let's pray and go before the Lord. Father, thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, that it shows us who you are. It shows us your character. It shows you what you have done to get us to where we are. And Lord, it shows us who we are. Father, it is both a light and a mirror. And Lord, as a mirror, it shows us what we look like. And I pray this morning, as we get into your word, that we would see what we look like. And Father, that we would make the adjustments as we do in a mirror. Father, as we see some things out of place, may we turn to you that by your power, that you would transform and change us as we are obedient to your word. And then, Lord, we ask that we would gain hope from it, and it would be a light as it shines bright for us to walk forward. Father, we commit this to you. If there's any among us this morning that, Lord, don't know you, I pray that the scripture would highlight, Lord, your desire to have all come to know you. So we thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. amen. You may be seated. See, even as we looked last week, I mean, last two weeks ago, even as we looked at chapter three of how he was telling us that he took no confidence in the flesh, he used to be a flesh confidencer. No, it's not a word. <laughs> he used to be one who took confidence in his attainments and his acquisitions and what he did and who he was. He took confidence. He boasted of it. And we actually hear of of how he could have, and really what you hear is how he did boast in his flesh. When he talks about his lineage and his heritage, when he talks about his knowledge, especially his knowledge of the law, when he talks about his lifestyle and talks about according to the law, he was righteous. 
He had arrived. There wasn't any more to learn. He was like, there was none better than me, guys. But then he came face to face with Christ, with real perfection. And when he did, he was never the same again. One of the things he realized, he said, is I'm not as flawless and faultless as I thought I was. And we'll see it here. And then we get this picture that he tells them to watch out for those kind of people. He called them dogs, the mutilators, the hackers of the flesh. He said, watch out for them because they're going to try and get you to think that something other than being in Christ is what's going to catapult you forward in your Christian life. They're going to want you to think that just like them, that if you just add on to your Christianity, their Jewish religious laws and their rules, and if you get circumcised physically, and if you follow what we follow and what we were given, then you will be truly. And anytime you hear someone add on the gospel and, you need to be careful. Now, the gospel causes growth. And the gospel allows us to enter into a relationship with Christ and grow in Christ. But be careful of those that say, you can be a Christian if you do, and they present the gospel, and. If they don't pause with the period, if they don't stop, and they keep going, you need to pay attention. And last week we realized that there is nothing better than being in Christ. And what in Christ meant, and that was that relationship. It was started by him and that he is enough. One of the things that always intrigues me about Judas, when he walked with Christ, Judas is a story of when Jesus is not enough. When I read the story of Judas, I go, when perfection is not enough. See, it wasn't getting any better than Jesus. He wasn't going to meet any other person more solid, more perfect, more compassionate, more purposeful than the one he walked with for three years. And yet, he betrayed him. And for us, that's a reminder that we can say we have come to know Christ and sheer perfection, no one and nothing better, and yet we live our lives wanting more than him. And we need to be careful that we don't fall into the Judas syndrome, that we are walking with Jesus and Jesus is not enough. And what it really showed was that Judas was walking with him physically, but he might as well have been in another nation, another planet, because he wasn't with him spiritually. So as we look at this this morning, chapter 12, he now, as we said that he... He, he finishes up and says that by any means possible, in verse 11, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. He says that my goal is to one day be standing in the presence of Christ. That's the resurrection of the dead. He said, because we all are going to go that way except those that will be snatched, as Scripture says. But most of us will go that way. And he says that by any means I look forward to being resurrected because Christ was resurrected from the dead and I will be standing before him. That is the pinnacle of what I am, what, why, I am why I am doing, excuse me, what I am doing. And as he takes a look at it, he says, but then he gets to a reminder. And this morning, three things we're going to look at quickly here. We're going to look at a realization that he makes. We're going to look at a response to that realization. And then we're going to have a reflection that he wants us to consider, a reflection that we must continually have in that. So the truthful realization is in verse 12 and 13. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Now, he just talked about all those things which I held confidence in, all those things that I saw as being what made me who I was, he just said in the previous section, all that was garbage, all that was poop. That really what it meant. All that was on the dung heap. He said, it had the value of, it had the value of garbage when it compared. Now, he wasn't throwing away his education. He wasn't saying that it didn't matter and it didn't count. He wasn't throwing away anybody having a career or having economic stability. What he says is we are comparing the purpose of life. And when you compare Christ and knowing Christ 
everything else is garbage. That's what he laid out. He said, everything else falls far short. And so then he turns around and says, my goal is to know him in the power of his resurrection. And we get the picture that Paul was doing it. And he was doing it flawlessly. And he was doing it without error. And he wasn't stumbling. But then he throws that great reminder to us. And he says, let me give you a truthful realization. The realization is perfection, flawless perfection, will not be ours on this side of eternity. See what he does. He, he, he takes the pressure off. He says, although that is my goal, although that is my pursuit, although that is my passion, that I know him and that I understand what it means to live in Christ and obediently following him, he turns around and says to them, but I just need you to know something. Not that I have already obtained or am already perfect. All of the translations add an article. It'll say, not that I have already obtained this. And this was not in, or any one of those was not in the original text. The original text says, not that I have already obtained. Obtained what? Well, he's going back to the previous verse. All, all those things he talked about in knowing Christ, in being in being gripped by Christ. He came to know Christ, but he doesn't perfectly know Christ. That's all of our experience. For those of you who have come to faith in Christ, you have come to know Christ, but there's not one of us in here today that can say, I have arrived. There is nothing else I can learn. I am settled. Don't teach me anything else about being in Christ. I got it. I heard it. I'm done. See, what he said is, although I've obtained Christ, I've not fully obtained Christ. And it's the tension that although I have come to know him, I don't fully know him. Although I am trusting in him, I'm not fully trusting in him. And see, you see what he's telling us is that there is a process here. It's a lifelong process. We'll see something later. He's not giving us an excuse. But what he's telling us is that understand, for those of us that have the perfectionist gene, and we like to get things totally right without error, and I can't do it well if I can't do it perfect, he says this is one of those things that is not going to happen. He said your life in Christ is a process, and it is a process where you are increasing growing in your maturity, in your relationship with Christ, in your relationship with God. I mean, there are times where you have great successes, but you and I both know there are times where you go, Lord, what have I done? And this lets us know God's not kicked you out the boat. He's not thrown you out the family. He understands that this is a process, this whole word sanctification that we use and, and, and increasingly being separated from the sinful world we've been called from and its habits and being linked to righteousness in God. It's a process. I know we like to say we did it one time. I did it one time, Lord. But God says, no, you have to do it all the time. God, I went hard one time. You saw me when I did that. God says, you have to go hard all the time. Let me tell you, your favorite sport, you were watching the ball game, and, 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 and some of us talking about this with, with basketball, you have those guys that will go hard all the time, and those guys that will go hard sometime. And you have those guys that are clutch, and those guys that wish they were clutch. See, my point is, no one in the long run wants to depend on the person who's going to give it their all sometime. Because the time you decide not to may be the time that it affects me the most. Or the time that you decide not to may be detrimental for me and my family. And so God says, we don't take off plays, but we know that sometimes we mess up plays. Sometimes we know what the play calls for, but we end up in the wrong spot. We end up being distracted by something else, and instead of going where we should have gone, we went where we thought we should have gone. And what he's telling us is perfection is not ours, but perfection is our pursuit. 
So he says, I am not, he says, I've not obtained it. He says, I've not obtained. Obtained all of that, knowing Christ, living in the power of the resurrection, living in, I mean, living by faith and righteousness that comes by faith in God. I'm not fully there yet, but I'm getting there. And so he tells us that perfection will not be reached, but perfectionism is to be avoided. What do I mean by that? Boy, do you, you get on people. You, you know, here's my deal. I learned this years ago, and I have to always remember this. We judge ourselves by our intentions, don't we? Yeah. Talk about it. We judge ourselves by what we intended to do. Well, I intended to do it. I intended to get that done. I had planned to get it done. And so in our mind, we're okay because I had intended to do it. But we judge others by their actions. Yo, homeboy, you didn't do it. Man, I intended to, but you didn't do it. And so we like to judge others. I mean, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by our actions. Paul says, no, come on. Mm -mm. Quit the perfectionism. And even in ourselves sometimes, the perfectionist attitude, we mess up and we can't get up. We fall and we stay down like that old commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. It's, it's, it's the point that our perfectionist mindset says, I should not have tripped. Yeah, no, I should have been obedient, but I wasn't. And God says, learning moment, object lesson, go back. How did you fall? What caused you to fall? Where did you take your eyes off me? And what he is saying is that you don't fall and stay there. You don't fall and make an excuse about being there. He says, you fall, own up to it, and realize, wow, learning moment. I'm still in the family. God hasn't kicked me out. Yeah, this might have been the fourth, fifth time that this has happened. It may be the 25th time. There may be some issues that you need to deal with, but you're still in the family. And see what he's telling them here is, look, Philippians, you got some dogs, we heard that from the early chapter 3, that are trying to get you to live outside of in Christ. They are trying to get you to say, Christianity and this will just guarantee you happiness in life. And he says, I'm telling you that the process of learning to live in Christ is lifelong. The day you quit is the day you have died. What do I mean by that? The only time you and I should quit and give up as believers and say, I'm done, is when you are standing in front of Jesus Christ face to face. Then indeed, you are done. Up until then, God says, keep going hard every day. He says, not letting up, and here's what he says, too. He goes, he says, I used to think I arrived when I was outside of Christ, and all of my accomplishments caused me to think I've arrived, but I realized I hadn't even gotten started. Then when I came to Christ, I realized the only time I'll arrive is when I'm standing in front of Jesus. And so I never arrive in this life. I'm always learning. You can tell me something. Even if I know, Paul is telling them here, here is the guy who is writing to them, and God will use this to teach us, and he says, I haven't arrived. But then he gives, he is living for why he was given life. I wrote this down. Then he tells us, he says, he says in in. in and later in the verse, but I press on and make it my own because Christ has made me his own. Other versions say that I have, I've pressed forward to apprehend Christ um, because of why he has, appreh because this is why he has apprehended me. Understand this, he said, I've been apprehended, I've been grabbed, I've been made own by Christ. He made me his own, and so because of that, I am now making him my own. Understand again, let me say, he is saying that because I belong to Christ, I am constantly learning how Christ belongs to me. I am making it personal every day of my life, more and more personal, because I've already been gripped by Christ. Understand what he's not saying is that you are not doing the initial work. The initial work has been done. When? 
Christ owned and grabbed you. And because he grabbed you, now you are turning and you are learning how to grab him. And it's throughout our life. And if we ever stop desiring to grab him, we have fallen into a space where God has not called us to be. That's not part of the upward call. That's, not of the, that, that, that's a part of the downward spiral. Because he said to us, since I've been gripped by him, since I've been apprehended by him, it is only natural that I now for him I'm sorry, now that he was apprehending me, now that I would apprehend him. So with that, look at his response. You understand that he is not living for himself. Here's the first thing he's not doing. He is not excusing himself. He says, brothers, verse 13, brothers and sisters, you just meant brethren, I do not consider that I have made it my own. He says, but one thing I do was added when all the translations for clarification, the actual way it was written just says, but one thing, and you could hear the emphasis that he's making. When he was writing this, he says, I have not apprehended. I'm not perfect. I'm not there, but one thing. Or, or he was saying, but the only thing he says is, but one thing, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Look at what he is not doing. The first thing he's saying, he is not excusing himself. See, many of us, I'm going to read it as I wrote it. Many of us, either we justifying our opinions, we like to claim, I'm not there yet. I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. And then we say, and then we continue to live sinfully and selfishly. And we like it. And we want to stay there. But I'm not perfect. Stop judging me. I'm not perfect, man. <laughs> Paul says, I'm not perfect either, but I'm pressing. Yeah. I'm pursuing. What am I pursuing? Perfection. Perfect. Will I ever get it on this side? No. But when I stand face to face with Christ, he says that we will be like him. Why? Because we will see him as he is. See, he says to us, don't fall into that trap of saying, hey, I'm not where I used to be, but I'm greater. Yeah, just as long as you don't stay there. And many of us, we are living in victories from 10 years ago. We are living in the testimony from five years ago. We are living in the knowledge of God that was revealed to us that we saw from three years ago. I want to ask, do you have a current testimony about how you know Christ? Can you go back and say, yesterday... Let me show you what the Lord did in my life. Today, let me tell you what he's teaching me. What Paul was telling them is that I constantly pursue Christ, constantly pursue him, that I can tell you recently what I've done in him lately. Janet wasn't all wrong when she said, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> God doesn't need you to do anything for him, but, you, but what are you doing in him? Yeah. If, if, if my only testimony is from 10 years ago, I'm stuck. If my only testimony, boy, I remember when I came to the Lord, and man, how I was on fire for God. And man, was, and someone turns to me and said, dude, that was 20 years ago. The picture that he's painting here is of continual pursuing. He says, no, I will never have flawless perfection, not as long as I'm in this sinful body. But let me tell you something. I have increasing sanctification. I am constantly growing in holy living. I am constantly increasing in purity. You can't lay hold of some things. Oh, yeah, you can see me when I trip up, but you see me get back on course because I'm not taking any plays off. When you look at my life, what you see is a person going hard after the Lord. And so then he says, look, he's not excusing himself. He is disciplining himself. 
When he says, I press, I say, he says, forgetting what is behind, I don't live on yesterday's victories. Now, he could have, some suggested he could have had his sinful past, but the way this is written, what he is forgetting is saying, I'm not living off of just yesterday's victories. I'm looking forward to new ones. Be, and that's the straining ahead, and it's a running term. It is a runner reaching forth with everything. Almost as you go to finish the finish line, you are, you are neck and neck with some other people, and you are straining and stretching, and you just want every ounce of you is pulling forward. God says, that is where he has apprehended us to be. His whole reason for apprehending us was so that we would continually reach out like that every day, apprehending him. He says, I press. And what do I press towards? I press towards the upward call. He says, I've been called. And I wrote this. I have to read it as I wrote this out. He says, I press toward the call, and that call was coming out of sinful rebellion and obedience to Christ, salvation, and so the attainment of the prize of, of, of being with Christ at the end of the race is the fulfillment of God's call at the beginning of the race. Let me read that again. He said, because he, he, is, he is pressing forward to the prize. What is the prize? The prize is Christ. I know we'll get crowns and we'll get rewards, but the prize is Christ. And so the attainment of the prize of being with Christ at the end of the race it says, is the fulfillment of God's call to you at the beginning of your race. The reason he called you out of sin was so that you would finish the race standing in front of Christ. He said, I didn't call you that you would get a lot of stuff. That's just stuff that happens along the way. My call wasn't one in which you would do ministry. And so you're a pastor, and now all of a sudden you are, you are responding to God's call. No, the response to the call of God was when I said, yes, I'm a sinner. And I said, yes, I need your salvation. That was the response to the call. Along the way, I'm just being obedient, and you are too, to the will of God. But to finish the race isn't here, being in ministry, being a pastor, being someone who's serving. The finish of the call is standing in front of Jesus. And until we're there, we're not finished. He says to us, the lifelong process, I am exhausting myself. And so what I was getting ready to say earlier is that either we like to claim I'm not there yet and we continue to live selfishly and sinfully, or we get legalistic and we selfishly and sinfully parade around looking down on everyone who is not where I am. And God says, neither of those are good. And then he ends up taking us through after we have a realization and we have a response and that response is that I, I don't excuse myself, I discipline myself so that I can stretch and strain forward every day. Then he says, here's a reflection at the bottom, verse 15. I love what he says. I'm going to give an end with that. He says this. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Two things. He says he is giving us, he is giving us what the mature Christian thinks, how the mature Christian lives. He says perfect, I mean, imperfect, but seeking perfection. Imperfect, but seeking perfection. Never settling for less than progressing on to perfectly obeying Christ. Not excusing myself, well, you know, I'm doing most of it good. I'm okay with some of it. God says, you don't settle for that. He said, the mature Christian thinks this way. What way? How I just shared it. The mature Christian says, brothers, I'm not perfect, but boy, am I pursuing it. That's the mature state of mind. But then he tells us, maturity thinks along the same lines as Christ. He said, if the mature among you think this way, it takes us back to that, have the same mind in you that was in Christ. That's what he's taking us back to. 
He says the mature Christian thinks along these lines. But then also, the mature Christian allows God to reveal handling minor differences. You know what? We are not going to agree on everything. They're not majors. Paul says, and if on other things, and that other is minor, if on other things we don't think alike, I like what he says. He doesn't say, let me tell you how to think. He didn't say that. You know what he said? God will reveal it to you. I'm going to let God tell you that one. Well, hold on a second. The great Paul is not going to tell me how, what God wants to say. And he says, no, they're minor. I don't need to get tripped up over the minor things that we disagree on, on whether I wear this or I wear that, whether I work at that place or I work there or whether we, but when it comes to the essentials of the faith, he says, mature people think this way. He's given you how to think. But when it comes to those minor things that we make major things, Paul says, God will reveal it. I love it. He says, I'm leaving that one for the Lord to deal with you because you're mature. And I know that you will listen to God. God will speak to you. If we do need to talk, we'll talk about it. But here's the problem. When Christians make minor things, major things, we missed the major things. How you wear your hair, where you work, what you drive, where you live, where you don't, where you work, how much you make. All these things that we stock up and pile up, how you live, how you parent your kids, how you choose, how you, we go on down the line and we major in the minors. I want to know, have you trusted Christ? Have you learned to live in him? Are you experiencing him daily? Are you living obediently to the word of God that you know and that you're reading so that you get to know more? These are the major. Where do we line up on the major things that the scripture talked about? And so Paul says three things. Realization, I'm not perfect. Response, but I'm pursuing it. I don't excuse myself, I discipline myself. And then thirdly, the reflection, he says, all of us who are mature think like this. We think along the same lines, encouraging others to think along those same lines. And where we disagree in those things that are minor, we give before the Lord and say, God, work it out in our lives. And he gives us this pattern for how we live for him. I love what he laid out, but he also gives prelude, and we're going to see this next week. He gives an intro into those that are to be avoided. He tells us how we are supposed to live. Remember, two weeks ago when I talked about deliberative rhetoric or deliberative speech, he gives two options. He gives an options for recommendations on how to live, and he gives options on how to or what to avoid or who to avoid. And we saw that two weeks ago when he told them that we are the true circumcision, and he gave us that triad of what that means. Go over from chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 11. You'll see that. But then he also tells them whom to avoid, and we saw that. Avoid the dogs, avoid the mutilators of the flesh, avoid the false circumcision. And so he's telling us who to avoid and who to accept, what to be like and what to reject. And he does that. And today we just saw, he said, here's how you should be. Next week he's going to tell us who you should avoid as we look at this. And so today I ask you that question. Got any victories lately? What have you done in him lately? How, has, how is he shining through your life now? What testimony do you have of the Lord's faithfulness today? How are you letting him use you currently? How are you obeying him currently? Don't live on yesterday's victory. Press on toward that mark. Because that calling is high and it is upward. He calls us. He has saved us so that one day we will be standing in front of him. Not that we would standing back making excuses about how we haven't lived. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, that we indeed, God. Father, we have been apprehended by you. We have been grabbed. We have been gripped. We have been rescued. You have 
laid hold of us and made us your own if we know Christ. And Father, because of that, Lord, we are now making you our own daily. And I pray that you would continue to teach us what it means to make you our own. Father, I pray that we would not excuse ourselves in our sin. Father, I pray that we would not excuse our complacency, that we would not excuse our lacks. Lord, that we would not excuse not wanting to press forward, but Father, we would, instead of excusing ourselves, I pray that we would discipline ourselves. Father, that we would stand before you ready, going hard and others seeing how we are pressing because our goal is to stand before you. Father, I pray if we have any other goal as our top priority, Lord, I pray that you will show us that and let us rid ourselves of it through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, may we be transformed daily more and more into Jesus Christ, looking like him, transformed into the image of Christ, Lord. Not looking back, but stretching and straining forward. Father, help us in Christ's name, amen. I'm going to ask you just to keep your head bowed and eyes closed real quick. Just a couple of things I want you to remember. If there's anyone here today, you hear this and you go, I've not responded to that call initially. God has been calling, but I've not been listening. I don't know him. I've never trusted him. I've, I've never been forgiven of my sins. I've never realized that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. I've never been forgiven of my sins. I've never come to him agreeing with him that I am a sinner and that I need salvation and that by needing salvation, he is the only one that can provide it. I've, I've never recognized that and thus I've never asked Jesus to forgive me. And as a result of that, I'm not his. If that is you this morning, I would love to pray for you just quickly. I would love to pray for you. I would love to lead you into the best thing that will ever happen to you in your life. I promise. Just raise your hand. I would love to pray for you. And if this is too hard of a moment, if this is too tough, I'm going to ask that you see me afterwards. I would love to talk to you about what it means to start a true relationship with Christ. And then next, if you're here today and you know you've not been going hard consistently, can I ask you to spend some time today committing before the Lord? If you are truly His, Father, I'm going hard for you, but I will need your power to do it. It will only be by, because it is only by your call that I even want to do it. So it will only be by your power that I will do it. And I ask you today that in your time alone, that you would get with the Lord and talk to him about what it means to go hard regularly. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that those who are here today that don't know you, Father, you would continually work on their hearts Prick it, Lord, that they would know that you, the Savior, love them and want to transform their lives. And those that have been transformed, I pray, God, that you would just energize us, that we would be obedient daily to you, Lord, not holding back and not living on past victories. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.